Hi, welcome to the Jason Hill Show. My name is Jason Hill, and my guest today is Cindy Gross, who is the host of The Jewish Patriot, and her show and column features headline news and cultural trends that emphasize that you don't have to be Jewish with Cindy to discuss some of the issues that we are going to talk about. Cindy is an award-winning public school teacher. Cindy is also a whistleblower who exposes many scandals and the questionable curriculum years ago um, that, that, that made the headlines in her news. And she's also someone who confronted Randy Weingarten, who is the president of the American Federation of Teachers, about the safety and policies in a failing school district. Um, Cindy and I are going to talk about a lot of issues. We're going to talk about, you know, why our schools are failing, why our public schools are failing. Um, we're going to talk about just what's up with this 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 Van, Randy Weingarten. I think I heard Mike Pompeo say that she was the most dangerous woman in America, or the most dangerous person in America at a at a conference where we both gave keynote speeches. Uh, we're going to talk about COVID. We're going to talk about anti-Semitism in this country today. Um, who who's inflicting damage against whom? Um, and we're going to talk about exactly what did Cindy see, what uh, that upset her, that got her start, started on this road of being a whistleblower. Uh, some of the incidents that happened in Loudoun County, Virginia. What's her message for teachers? Uh, we'll be right back with a most, most exciting guest and a great patriot of our republic. Again, this is the Jason Hill Show, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. My guest is Cindy Gross. Cindy, uh, thank you for joining the show. I know that you are well known among many, many of our great patriots, and in, especially in conservative circles. But for guests who might not know that much about you, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, tell our guests a little bit about you, about yourself? First of all, thank you, Jason, for having me on the show. Uh, it's truly an honor. I consider you as well a patriot, a grassroots unsung hero. People like you, and I don't want to say me, but it's true, we do a lot of the hard work for grassroots and not enough people know about us, but we're going to change that for the future important elections. Anyway, my name is Cindy Gross. I am the host of the Jewess Patriot. I am today's premier Jewish woman activist. And I am the only religious Jewish woman on mainstream media. You don't have to be Jewish with Cindy. And what I try to do is bring the issues that are headlines and trends that are of importance to the Jewish community to a mainstream audience so that all of us can join together. Because it's really education of facts, as you all know as an educator. And finding common ground in simple things and not so simple things that originally made America great, that is struggling to keep America great now because it's not so great. It was a little bit a little while ago, but somehow it changed in the past couple of years. And we have to fight for our superpower status in the future. In addition, I ran in 2020 as a pro-Trump America Choice candidate against the establishment in a primary for the GOP. And of course, the GOP establishment, uh, rhinos that they were, uh, picked somebody who was not an America first person and lost big time. And I'm known for that. I do a lot of writing. I write in many uh, publications that are Jewish and Israel oriented, as well as mainstream. And my goal is to bring together people to teach them the best I can factually that we have more in common than we don't, but we must be more educated. Otherwise, we are going to fall apart very soon. Linda, you, you, you started off um, your activism, I think, around some of the really questionable policies inundating our public school system. Is that right? 
I actually started, believe it or not, uh, in 2015. Well, for, you're right. As far as politically, 2015, but as far as being an activist for doing what was right, I was an award-winning school teacher, uh, teaching third grade, second grade, in a school in a middle-class minority neighborhood where houses are four and five hundred thousand dollars. Yet I saw so much, for lack of a better word, failure and corruption that was affecting real Democrats, for lack of a better word, minorities. We had a principal who was arrested for stealing money from HUD, one government agency, and was allowed to keep her job and retire with full benefits. Where else could you do that except in a public school system? We had in our school an assistant principal who was in our school in what they would call the administrative rubber room because she was the direct supervisor of a teacher in another building that was later found guilty of sexually harassing second grade girls. We have a superintendent, I reported, and after I was I'll go through my lawsuit, but after I filed my lawsuit and I had an illegal termination on me because they did retaliation, which is totally against federal and state laws, but we'll go through that. I mean, the superintendent was fired for sexual harassment. I saw grades being uh, socially promoted that shouldn't have been. I saw administration and other teachers physically and emotionally abuse students. And as mandated reporters, we are required by law to uh, report any suspected activities of abuse and neglect in a home. And when I did, and my confidentiality was legally broken by administration, uh, there were massive cover-ups. And the way we have proof of this is Because I filed my lawsuit, it was written up in the New York Post, and six months later, an illegal termination was brought, charges were brought against me. Um, And we have proof of it because the DOE and Randy Weingarten were so eager to get rid of me that they actually paid for a transcript. We have the documentation from teachers, from parents, from students, everything I reported turned out to be true, from a a principal slapping a student to questions about uh, neglect in homes to uh, questions about reporting safety issues. We are putting people at risk. And it doesn't matter whether or not you're a Republican or a Democrat. Education is a nonpartisan issue that needs bipartisan support. And we see every single day who's getting hurt the most by the failing school policies and and woke education, which was going on. They just didn't call it woke. How did you report this? How did you report all of this? Well, I followed the the ladder that you're supposed to. I went to the local, you you know, my local school U of T representative. He, of course, uh, was working with the, with the principals. And that's what happens in the, many of the schools. Instead of protecting the teachers who pay dues to get their protection, they actually work so they get perked, perked up jobs and they all coordinate working together so that schools get good evaluation so that people want to come. It's all a business. It's all about the money trails and who's making money out of this. If a school doesn't have complaints against them, if there aren't safety reports filed against them, then they get more money. Then they can hire teachers the way they want to. You know, the whole evaluation system is wrong. It's not a a fair evaluation system. An evaluation system should be testing. We have teachers who can't speak English, can't do math, have no idea about what American history is, but... Because they take these courses that are through teacher union connections and supervisors, you know, we just say teachers unions. It's supervisor unions and safety school unions. There's millions upon millions of dollars there. And no one wants to give up that kind of power. So everybody has this idea of look the other way, and we're seeing the impact of it. And as much as parents are fighting today, what I started almost two decades ago, 
we're still losing the battle because so many local elections are being controlled by the teachers unions. What what is what is your solution to the problem of the teachers union? Well, first of all, I think in all fairness, voters have to become more educated. It has to start on a grassroots level. Parents have to become more involved in schools. I understand parents today. There are many single family homes. There are many parents that uh, one parent homes, but it's no excuse. Immigrants that came over 200 years ago and went into the public schools didn't know English the way uh, immigrants are today. Immigrants are today, but they sent their kids to school to show respect and to learn English and the American value system. Today, schools have 26 different languages except English to accommodate that. It doesn't work. This doesn't go on in countries where education is successful. Then you need real evaluations of teachers and real evaluations for students. There has to be some kind of a uniform where some people pass and some people fail. You can't have everybody winning and you can't have evaluations that supervisors go in and if they like you, they write you up nice things if they're not true. And if they don't like you, they write you up to fail you and fire you because you don't fit their uh, agenda. And just think of it this way. Randy Weingarten stated it recently about white parents and white teachers and the white educators. But you know what? When I was teaching, it was the same thing going on. It was gradually, she might be Jewish and white and a woman, but she doesn't support her people and support uh, the uh, everybody in a system. She's supporting people that she could get votes from and money at the expense of our students, our teacher safety, and our parents and our communities. Because if a school fails, people leave communities. If a school fails, then money is lost in that community. Small businesses fail. The selling of houses go down. So it's very important to acknowledge just how important a good school is to a community. Are you against some of the amelioration of these problems taking place at the federal level? Or do you think it really is a local grassroots level that has to be addressed? primarily by parents? Everything starts grassroots. 2023 is the year of local elections. And I tell people, go meet your party leaders. Go meet everybody from both sides. They're at the level that you could actually meet them. And they want to meet you. And then you talk to your friends and you have, you know, thank goodness today you have Zoom, you have WhatsApp groups. People know everything. They tape everything. I see a big trend, especially of black men who are willing to fight for their children getting out of failing public schools, but they have they don't know where to go, and they Jews and blacks have something in common, which we've discussed before. We somehow think that if we try to change and vote Republican that it's going to end all the giveaways and entitlements. They've never thought about seeing what happens if they try something new, and maybe they could have some change. Voting in the same people constantly and get, and even recognizing that they're only looked at for votes right before an election and still voting the same way, well, it is a local. But then again, on the federal you know, President Trump ran in 2016, and I really loved when he said this about diminishing the power of the Department of Education or eliminating it. And then he picked Betsy DeVos, who turned out to be a disaster. And he is running again. There's an excellent possibility he's going to be the candidate for the Republican Party. I hope that President Trump, who was really amazing in policies, really, really, really stands firm on keeping the promise of eliminating or diminishing the power of the Department of Education and putting into place criteria that help people regardless whether they are an R, a D, an I for independent. 
and we're, and this will actually help bring people together with common ground. It's the issue that counts, not how you vote. So what is your ultimate message for parents? I know you talked about single dads, like black fathers who are just sort of are not privy to the kind of information that they would need in order to get involved. What is your message for parents overall? First of all, there are too many people like myself. We need whistleblower protections. I have been destroyed because I stood up for what was right. I wasn't a teacher who was having sex with a student or cheated on grades. I was an award-winning student. A award winning teacher, and my students did well that actually worked hard and wanted to achieve. That was proven. I'm telling parents if you really care about your children, every single day, question school, meet other parents, talk to other students, make surprise visits, especially during lunch hours and dismissals, take notes. And get together with other like-minded parents. There are certainly enough places where parents are speaking out. This is a national issue. But if you take your local school in New York and your local school in Illinois and your local school in Maryland, suddenly people are going to start to notice and it's going to get attention. And you can always reach out to me through the radio show, through Jason Hill, through uh, social media, I have connected a lot of parents, a lot of people who want to meet up with their local uh, elected officials and talk about this. This is not a one-party issue because there are plenty of Republicans that do not want to stand up. They fear the teachers union. So they're not really the people we should be supporting either in elections. There's also Parents Unite. I'm not a parent, but I'm a, a member of, of Parents Unite, which is located in Boston. And it's a sort of bipartisan organization which draws from parents from all over the country who come together a couple of times a year to sort of bring speakers, educators, and parents together to discuss exactly what's going on in the K through 12 um, uh, business. Uh, I call it the business complex um, because the government does have a course of monopoly on education. But um, some of the stories I heard, Cindy, they were just absolutely horrific. You know, um, school districts, whole school districts, sort of administering antidepressants uh, to their to students behind the parents' back, also gendering or non-gendering the students behind their parents' back, the, um, the, the parents of the children's back, and telling their children, the students not to tell their parents that they are non-gendering them in classes and so on and so forth. Um, what do you, why don't you go over what happened in, in Loudoun County and how does your story relate to what we see today as far as education and the incidents and issues in, in my Minnesota. situation is totally different. I was a teacher. I took notes every day, which you're supposed to do. I, I, con I went as high as the mayor's office, giving them documentation. I have the email from the mayor's office that I had whistleblower protection. I even gave them the, you know, from the contractual obligations where there were, you know, deficiencies, what was going on that they were breaking the law. And instead of saying, Cindy Gross, thank you, they they tortured me. They, they did all kinds of things. It's part of my lawsuit. I'm kind of limited on what I could say, but I can tell you based on the transcript, everything I reported, whether or not falsifying fire alarms and not reporting it, that came out. Uh, I reported about a student who was so aggressive, he threatened to kill me, a second grader. You would think that the schools would be concerned when second graders are threatening to kill teachers and, and threaten to kill other students. So this kid took a toy gun to the lunchroom. I wasn't there. It really isn't my obligation to report it, but I had a conscience. The people in the lunchroom ignored it. The arbitrator paid by the teachers union saw uh, documentation of st student statements, heard from parents, heard from other teachers, and you know what the, the arbitrator said? This is a judge. It's a second grader. It's just a toy gun. It's my fault for making more out of it. 
The kid actually told kids he's gonna shoot them and shoot their brains off. Where do you think the the kids who were twenty got this from? They saw it and were allowed to do it in second grade. Yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm I'm blown away. A second grader, I just I'm I'm, I'm sitting here stunned. I'm speechless. Then we found out. Uh, through testimony that I didn't even know, in first grade, his first grade teacher, the principal, the assistant principal, the guidance counselor knew that he was found in first grade during a lunchtime with a girl touching each other and nothing happened to them. The parents weren't even told about it. Well, you know, p- teachers are listening to this broadcast. There are going to there are gonna be some teachers, I imagine, who might listen to this, 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 this broadcast, this podcast. And what do you say to teachers? Like, what do you, what do you, what do you say to teachers who are? Well, I'm going to tell you, and, and, and a lot of, a lot of times teachers are so afraid to stand up for what's right. And they're intimidated that they actually act out against me. I was really, I mean, I have notices that went out from the U of T representative, a teacher harassing me and threatening me. I have other notes about teachers threatening me and phone calls that were made threatening me because they're afraid to lose their job. That's that's how much power the teachers unions have. Look how much you want to compare in Loudoun County. Let's look at how many local elections for school boards that there have been since Loudoun County, and how many parents stood up, including groups like Moms for Liberty, and yet they lost so many elections because the teachers' unions threatened the teachers that if they go, you know, and, and don't win the elections, that they're going to lose their jobs. Well, is it, is it, is it the, so should the teachers' unions be broken up? You know, we were so quick to break up other monopolies in this, uh, in our American history. We have to look at some other issues to break them up. You know, we're supposed to have separation of school and church and state, and yet we look at the curriculum today. You're not allowed to say radical Islamic terrorist, but you're allowed to teach. You know, there are so many schools today that have textbooks that have pages in it that don't show Israel and just Palestine. And you have people standing up for Palestinian rights and BDS and anti-Judeo-Christian values. So part of that has to do, it's the whole structure of the curriculum and how we look at ourselves as Americans. And part of that is the money trails. So I think that we have to think about how we want these monopolies. And yet, Randy Wyanton is so close to President uh, Biden, was so close to the Obamas, was so close to the Clintons. I mean, I've heard rumors that she might be considered for a future higher office. And uh, should she have, if somebody, would you go to a restaurant over and over again that serves you bad food? Would you go to a doctor over and over again that misdiagnoses you? So why do you want to have a leader for the school system that produces failure after failure and costs so much money for all taxpayers? Well, let's let's ponder on that. We're going to take a short break, just a very short break, and then we'll be back with Cindy Gross um, talking about public education and among other things, among other things the corruption that's going on in the K through 12 system. I'm Jason Hale and you're listening to the Jason Hale show. Welcome back to the show. So Cindy, what is, let's say, well, if you were the secretary of education, I think you would be probably trying to find ways to disband your own um, ministry. So, <laughs> what what is the what are some of the tangible solutions that you would put forward? Um, because what you reported at the start of the podcast was horrific in terms of who you reported stuff to, information to, and what was done to you. 
Well, there's got to be some accountability. But if I was a secretary of education, the first thing I would do is redefine education and school choice. You see, uh, progressives and Democrats have a great PR system, much better than Republicans, independents, and conservatives. They have learned to put school choice on the defensive. I would make school choice on the offensive. When we say school choice, we should have quality school choice in public, in private, and in homeschooling situations. And it should be up to the tax-paying people to decide how they want to teach their children, number one. So I would redefine that. I would look at how other countries are exceeding in their education systems, like in the Middle East, I'm sorry, the Far East, in certain countries in Europe, who are way surpassing us, paying less money per student, and figure out what's going on. Do you know in China, class sizes are much bigger? But do you also know that if a student is absent in schools, that it's the responsibility of the parent to make sure that the student gets the work they missed and complete it. We don't have any of that kind of accountability here. And that's important. I would also change the evaluation systems. It has to be a more level field for people to achieve. And of course, the key word that's missing is merit. We must go back to a merit system. It is very scary to think that students that are failing elementary school and uh, middle uh, middle school and high school are going into medical schools now because of the color of their skin or where they were born versus the merit of them saving a life. It is a very scary thought. No, it is scary indeed. What about um, the fact that you know, we have to incentivize our teachers also by paying them more money. I mean, the, the, the extent to which teachers are underpaid is... Uh... I really have to, I have to tell you, th- during the pandemic, and I'm a teacher, I will tell you there were so many teachers getting full pay with benefits who I know was, and still to this day, are not teaching the level of what they are getting when so many small businesses have been struggling. I think there does have to be a little bit of a merit system, an award system where there is proof for better teachers. That's the way you're going to get a quality teacher if they feel that there's something worthwhile for them at the end of the time, you know, at the end of the rainbow. I also think there has to be a better oversight in the curriculum. In 2016, I actually went to local elected officials and uh, together we put together, it passed the New York State Assembly, uh, legislation about oversight of curriculum, but it was limited. Believe it or not, it was a Republican state senator who made the promise to bring it up on the floor and then backed away because he was afraid of the teachers' unions. So this is not a one-party issue. This is an issue for everybody from all backgrounds, all over the country. It's something we should make agreeable to everybody. Everybody wants safe schools. Everybody wants schools to be the center of their community. After all, so many people use schools for after-school activities and weekend activities. And it should be what it used to be a place where people feel secure. Only recently, people had this idea that schools are a place that you shoot up, you know, innocent victims. Schools are always a safe haven. Even during World War II, when there were bombings and everything, they were very careful about schools. People have no respect for schools, and we have to bring that back. And that's something I would work very hard on. At one point in our history, before we get on to some other subjects, at what point can you extensively point in our history did the nature of this of the teachers' union change so drastically that a cabal, a phalanx of individuals could amass so much power that parents themselves become so afraid of an institution that is in the interest of the teachers themselves, but really ought to be subordinated to the interests of education, teaching children? I think part of it has to do, and when I listen to people discuss Black history, because I'm fascinated by it and the relationship of Jews and Blacks, 
And I talk to people like um, Congressman Burgess Owens speaks about his childhood beautifully, about being from a middle class black neighborhood where and family values very similar to middle class Jewish neighborhoods and people like uh, DeRoy Murdoch who talks about it. I think a lot came with the promises of the 60s with the civil rights movement and social security and medic and all the entitlements that came into it that were promising the better lives for Jews and for blacks and for other minorities. And I think, you know, we see it not just in education, but in other areas, it's, it's really failing the middle class now. And the other thing I do see is uh, when in, in our case, when Mayor Bloomberg made the deal with Randy Weingarten, taking away tenure from supervisors, but not teachers, so that and giving them huge raises, so that the idea of do what you're told, keep your mouth shut, and you'll have a job, whether you're a good teacher or not, really affected it. And then, of course, the influx of people who were coming from areas of the world where, uh, they they didn't have English as a first language and they didn't know American history. And they're now in so many positions of power, especially in uh, failing city schools in Baltimore, in Los Angeles, in Chicago, in New York. And rather than taking the time to learn, if they wanted to be an educator, command of the American history of the language, how to write, uh, you know, simple math to teach. Why do we need fuzzy math? How about some simple math so that you could actually go into a store and get change and get it correctly? If that, you know, someone having to use a computer, you know, it, it's sad how today our young people don't even know how to count. It, it's, it, it boggles the mind. So those are the two th areas that I think the 1960s and probably around the 80s when the influx that we needed teachers and we just let anybody become a teacher basically let's shift topics a little bit we're going to come back and see what our audience is going to do uh, at the end of the 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 podcast to, to help you but i want to talk a little bit because you and i have talked about anti-semitism in the united states today it's increasing in an unprecedented rate i can see it as a professor on campus and on campuses, on my own campus, I can see it. Uh, I've witnessed it. I've witnessed it. We've all witnessed it in various readings and reports on campuses across America where the Students with Justice in Palestine, among other groups, the Young Socialists. There's a coalition of forces that are deeply anti-Semitic, but they do it under the guise of being anti-Zionist or sponsoring media's movements anti-Israel, po Israeli politics, which is a bunch of crap to me, really. It's just a, a way of expressing one's anti-Semitism on the guise of being against a certain set of Israeli politics. Um, so we, we see it, I see it as a sort of bourgeois movement on campuses that includes both blacks and whites, uh, progressives mainly. But we also see it's in the... And Jews. If you're going to be honest, there are plenty of Jews a part of this because they have no. Yes, I hadn't gotten to the I hadn't gotten to the Jews yet. Yeah, the very very progressive Jews that side with with the students for Justin in Palestine. Nothing caused me more concern than seeing that on my own campus, where uh, Hillel and other Jewish organizations sided with the students for Justin in Palestine. Um, so, and then we see it in the streets. You know, we just see it in the streets in the supermarkets. Jews being attacked in their communities and. In their in their supermarkets that they've constructed. So how do we how do we begin this conversation? Um, how 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 seriously? Well, let me get specific. How seriously do you take the threat of anti-Semitism in higher education and on the just on the ground level, where Jews are just it's horrific what happens in New York, you know, where Jews are just attacked in the streets and their places of business. And how serious a threat do you think this is? in America today. I think it's a serious step, but I'm going to correct you. Here's the mistake everybody makes. They think it starts on college campuses. Anybody who's an educator who takes master's courses learns that the brain for absorbing education really comes from the years between kindergarten and second grade. 
after that, what's everything you have learned is kind of like the, let's say your brain is the um, bark of the tree, the bottom, the trunk, and everything branches out. And you are taught so much misinformation from people that don't know what they're talking about today in schools. So that the time they get to high school, then they get to college, it's over. It's over, over, over. And unfortunately, as a Jew, I can say this, on, and it breaks my heart to say it, we have no Jewish leadership that knows how to fight this. We don't have any great Jewish organizations. We don't have great Jewish leadership in our rabbinical systems. We don't have great Jewish educators. So the combination of misrepresenting uh, Jews in the early stages of life so that by the time people get to college and they're expected to write thesis before learning fact is a big issue. And the lack of Jewish leadership. I have seen over the past few months in particular because of a certain activities going on, people are on social media repeating posts a hundred times a day. And I'll give you one example, Kanye West. Kanye West was taken off of Twitter. But Jewish influences and Jewish organizations gave him so much more attention because they kept retweeting it and kept putting up reels on Instagram. It should have been a unified force and it should have been with non-Jews together of some kind of a boycott, and financial, of course, the companies took money away, but we have no single leadership to help us. And the idea that higher education is going to, is where it starts, is the biggest fallacy of all. And for people that, I know you work with education groups that are part of your podcast and you work with regularly, those people are not succeeding because they are not hitting the issue where it starts. They're hitting the issue when it's too late. But we live in a free society. And I mean, the, the, it starts really in the home, right? It starts in places where one can't really encroach, you know, short of a blow to totalitarian state. So when I so when I say that college campuses and K through 12, those are areas where I didn't mean that they originate there because prejudice really starts in the home. But I mean, that's, that's the place where you know, particular action, be it legal, bureaucratic, or institutional action, can be taken to really sort of nip it in the bud. Um, we can expel students who engage in violence. We cannot teach ideas. Uh, we can hold, you know, we can hold conservative viewpoints on campus that would counter some of the more pernicious and nefarious anti-Semitic ideas that originate from the left. Um, but my, my 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 concern is that the 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 fountainhead of all of these pernicious anti-Semitic ideas originate in areas that, you know, a liberal state really can't encroach on people where they have psychotic and, and stupid ideas. You know what? Because today, until we go back to a system of family and faith and the idea of first, as in America first, until we go back to the basics and people have respect again, there's, you know, there's no respect for principals and teachers. How many times do you pick up a newspaper where a teacher's beaten up, a principal is beaten up and spit at by a parent? Who would ever 50 years ago go to a school, even if they were going there because their child was being falsely accused of something, they would never show disrespect the way they do. I remember watching a teacher, um, a principal, my principal, in fact, who I actually defended in this. It was a joke. I watched a parent curse her out and was ready to smack her. Where do you get this from? We have to reevaluate a lot of what we talk about as far as family values. And I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, hopefully, people are getting so tired of the wokeness. You know, everything goes in circles. Hopefully, we're coming to a point. 
that uh, people, you know, start to swing around that 180 and come back up to, you know, value. They see they're not succeeding. I mean, how many more times does as a parent have to watch a child shot in the middle of the night or walking off from school? I mean, how many more times do you have to go to a grocery store and see prices go up, but your paycheck isn't? At that point, it's going to make sense that I want to change. And wherever the where I'm not getting it from the people who keep promising me. So maybe I should try somebody new. Yeah, it's going to take a lot of. I mean, some people unfortunately have to be hit over the head twice to connect the dots. But it's going to. I've always said it's going to have to take a lot of suffering, and people are going to have to suffer, and they're going to have to particularly see their children suffer before they sort of make these uh, deep, deep, deep. Uh, changes in their lives before before anything comes up comes around i often think it's going to take something quite apocalyptic and quite seismic um seismatic for these for these changes to come around but um well maybe the threat of world war 3 will be the start of it because everybody i know for the first time is really concerned about world war 3 and what has happened the past 2 years to america well, this is, well, you know, this really bothers me. And when I heard, I have to tell you, when I heard Marjorie Green Taylor talking about a national divorce, that really broke my heart as someone who loves the United States of America. Um, you know, we're, we're falling, we seem to be falling apart of our own accord. And, uh, to talk about the disillusion of the states just was, was not what I really needed to hear. But yeah, we have lost our supremacy. We have lost our exceptional status in the world's eye. Um, we're we're still a beacon of light, I think, for many many peoples on the face of the earth. But um, it certainly is not the place that I came to 38 years ago at the age of 20. Um, it's lost that that stat that moral credibility that it once enjoyed in the in the world in the eyes of the world. But I still want to think that there's hope that it can be you know recovered. And well, as a Jew, I'll leave you with this. There's been anti-Semitism thousands of years ago. During this month, next week, we're celebrating Purim. We watched how an innocent young girl didn't care that she, you know, she feared, but she went to her cousin and told him about a plot to destroy all the Jews of Iran and destroy them. And we're still here and... We survived the Holocaust. It's hard now, harder than ever because of what's going on. And probably a hundred years from now, Jews will still be around. And as much, you know, we've watched everyday headlines about innocent young people being murdered just because they were Jewish uh, in Israel. But at the same point, the same exact weekend, we had over 5,000 people on a Saturday night in Times Square celebrate the end of the Sabbath, which was like unheard of. You see in Germany, you see people standing with uh, Jews. You just saw this week in Spain, Barcelona wanted to cut off ties with Israel. And yet rallies were held and pe- they heard the voices of the people and they're still keeping ties with Jerusalem. So I'm not giving up all hope, but I'm warning everybody, this is your wake-up call. If you don't take action now, you don't have much more time to take that action. And you are not alone. And it's the perfect time to stand up for what's right. And it doesn't matter what political party, it really doesn't matter how old you are, how rich or poor you are, what you do for a living, if you're disabled, if you're healthy, if you have blonde hair or bald, it doesn't matter. Common sense always wins if you're willing to put the effort into it. And you know what, Cindy? Morality and the exercise of your moral agency in the service of what you know to be right and you know to be true is always a winner in the end because I think reality ultimately rewards morality. I totally agree with you. We live in a society today, yeah. It's how goofy you can be and how many curse words you could you say. And how, as much as I don't like President Joe Biden, 
I don't like all the memes about him being sick and falling. and all. It's not funny. He's still the president of the United States. There still has to be a level of respect. Yeah, you know, you know, I tell my students, my students ask me this question all the time. They say, Dr. Hill, why do I have to be good in a world where bad things are going to happen to me? And this is what I tell them. And I said, and this will leave you hanging on with hope forever. I said, bad things will always happen to good people and bad things will happen to bad people. But bad things will always happen to good people because suffering is built. It's intractably built into the nature of reality. Your body's going to decay. You will die. People are going to disappoint you. Those whom you love, including your parents, will let you down and emotionally stand you up. But I said, no one has ever healed from the bad things that happened to them from a source of evil or character rot. So I said, you better cultivate your goodness because your goodness is the only source from which you will heal from the bad things that will inevitably happen to you. And once you continue cultivating your goodness in the world, not just as a source from which to heal, but as a wellspring from which to give others hope and inspiration and a place in which they can rest and seek respite when all the rest of the world have spat in their face, then your agency is active and you can always count on yourself as a beacon of hope for the rest of the world. And I, I really, that's one of the things I really like about you is that you all, you always have that sort of optimism that's wedded with an optimism that I too share. Well, thank you so much. I take that as a real compliment from you because you, you know what it's like to stand up for what's right and to be targeted for it like myself. And I'll be honest with you, you know, you say that and you made me think of something. Like people ask me, if you could sit down with Randy Weingarten and talk with her, what would you say? And I would say, you know what, first of all, do what's right and fix the wrong you made in my case, because I wasn't there to hurt you. And I think we could work together and find real good solutions. But you've got to sit down and talk and not attack. And that's the big problem, getting people to sit down from the opposite side and talk with you. Well, Cindy, before we go, what can our audiences, what can our audience do to help you? First of all, reach out to me. Uh, I am the Jewish Patriot. I am on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram. You can download my show on um, Spotify and iHeartRadio, all the major outlets. I'm on AM and FM syndicated throughout the country, uh, and I write lots of articles. Please reach out to me. We are not alone. And if anybody wants to help me with my lawsuit, I would love it. You know what's the saddest thing? Even people who claim to be on the right and want to help, they're afraid. Well, you know what? You won't be afraid if you have a lot of people around you and other teachers that have gone through what I've gone through or are going through it. Reach out to me because you are not alone. And we will work this through. And finally, if any of your people are in the press, please have me on as a guest. I'd love to share with you. I can share documentation and other witnesses to what happened. And if Randy Weingarten's listening, please reach out to me. I would love to have a conversation with you. Well, I'm going to try to reach out to her. I doubt that she'll respond because I would like to I too would like to have a conversation with her about a lot of things that I find quite uh, disturbing. Cindy, it's been amazing to talk to you. Thank you very much for sharing your story and the battles that you fought and and also for being a fighter and a warrior and a, um, for your, your goddess spirit that, that, that uh, imbues, I think, and suffuses everything that you touch and that you do in the world. And, and thank you for being an agent of good in, in our world. Thank you. I want to thank you because you and I are building a coalition that is very important, and that is the Black Jewish Coalition to work together. We have more in common than we don't. We could do great things together. I think so. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much, Dr. Jason Hill. The Jason Hill Show is a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center and Front Page Magazine unauthorized reproduction of this podcast without express written consent is prohibited.